Close your eyes. Just for a minute, go on, close them like I'm doing now. What I want you to do is try and remember what it was like to be a little child of six or seven years old when those imaginary worlds you conjured up in your head were just every bit as real as the world around you. For me, it was the soldiers that I bought at the toy shop in the high street. I used to take them home and as soon as I came out the box they sprang into life and I'd march them over my mum's flower beds. They had a life of their own, they seemed more alive to me than my pets. The comic strip Calvin and Hobbes is ostensibly a simple tale of a little boy and the stuffed tiger that he thinks is real. But it's also a testament to the power of a child's imagination as Calvin creates extraordinary fantasy worlds in his head. And the man we to thank for it is the strip's redoubtable creator, Bill Waterson. I think this is the place we're looking for. <clears throat> Hello, uh, Bill Waterson, creator of international comic strip phenomenon Calvin and Hobbes. Phil Jupiter's? Yes. Oh, nice to see you. Come along in. What do you want to talk about? Well, I'd like to talk about the strip, if I may, sir. Calvin and Hobbes? Yeah. Sure thing. Come along oh, in. Take fantastic. a wait up. I'll tell you all you want to know. Thank you very much. The whole nine yards. Marvellous. Cup of coffee? I'd love a cup of coffee. Actually, no. I think that's... Uh... A flight of fancy too far. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I should say I just made that whole bit up. Um, I didn't meet Bill Waterson, that was my producer, who, as you may have been able to tell, is uh, from Preston. You see, Bill Waterson is a remarkable man. Not only has he never allowed any merchandising of his creation, he's as unlikely to sit down for a chat as J.D. Salinger, Thomas Pinchon, Greta Garbo before she died. Or after she died, for that matter. My feelings aren't too badly hurt, though. I'm in very good company, according to Waterson's old editor, Lee Salem. We had a number of calls from studios uh, in Hollywood, and, and Spielberg was among them. And, and I, I actually remember talking with his assistant, and I had to explain to him, no, Bill Watterson is not interested in meeting with Mr. Spielberg. And there's kind of this silence on the other end. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, when I called, <laughs> when, I had to, when I explained it to Bill, he said, well, why would I want to meet with Steven Spielberg? The reason that Mr. Spielberg wanted to speak to Waterson is that his creation, Calvin, lies at the heart of a very ordinary America that's evoked with a profound tenderness. Apart from his parents and girl next door Susie Durkins, who's as much an enemy as a friend, Calvin has no one for company except for Hobbes. And most of the strips consist of the pair of them mulling over life's complexities from the back of a careening wagon in the summer and a sledge in the winter. Waterson himself grew up in the wonderfully titled town of Chagrin Falls, was sacked after a very brief spell as political cartoonist on the Cincinnati Post, then spent years piling up rejection slips while working a menial job living on peanuts. Darling, I said I'm gonna be 27 soon. I've only got rejection letters and a sense of impending doom. And I think it's too late for me. All the comic book companies hate me and I try, but it's always the same. And I guess my art is just lame. Eventually, he joined up the boy and his stuffed toy, named them after two particularly bleak philosophers, as you would, and then he was off to the comic strip races. I recall the instant when I read it, and, and it took my breath away, and it was so good, I set it aside because I thought, well, you know, maybe my uh, buyer rhythms are off today or something, and uh, uh, I came back to it a week later, I still had the same reaction and uh, all of us in-house knew we had a winner in our hands. And the word got around very quickly, and, and it's, it's the only strip I recall in my many years here that newspapers are actually calling us, saying, we hear this thing called Calvin and Hobbes is out there and we want to buy it. And uh, it just took off like a skyrocket. Uh, when the strip stopped at the end of 1995, it was in uh, a bit over 2,500 daily and Sunday newspapers around the world. Two and a half thousand newspapers were carrying it. Correct. That must that must be extraordinary <laughs> to, to to kind of have that kind of a reach. Well, uh, I'm only um, I'm only aware of uh, three strips with that kind of uh, readership. One was Calvin. Another, of course, was Peanuts, the great classic strip, and uh, Garfield. And I think one of the keystones of his success was he it did not talk down to children. What was the sort of the public reaction to it? Because obviously, you know, from your point of view, you're dealing with the editors and things, but how were you able to gauge what the public thought of it? Well, the mail was uh, immediate and uh, almost 
uh, unanimously positive. But with Calvin, with only a couple of exceptions, it was almost all positive and very widespread. I find it quite extraordinary to imagine that there's anything someone could complain about in Calvin and Hobbes. Well, <laughs> well there were a couple of, uh, there was one in which he uh, coughs up into a glass and gives it to Susie uh, for lunch. <laughs> And I think some readers, some readers were grossed out oh, by that. I think I'm with them, to be honest with you, Lee. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you can hear, I'm making my way upstairs. Uh, we're in Waterstones, making our way to the cartoon section to see, well, see how much Calvin and Hobbes there is available, but see if we can find a couple of fans, maybe. Please don't tell me it's another stand. So we're pregnancy and childcare, cookery, rock and pop. Here we are. There uh, we go. And just here, uh, we found uh, there's uh, Bill Watson's Calvin and Hobbes. So we got um, all the kind of uh, the collections. There's Scientific Progress Goes Boink, uh, The Revenge of the Baby Sat. Homicidal Psycho Jungle Cat, great collection there. Uh, there's treasure everywhere. Days are just packed. And Attack of the Deranged Mutant Killer Monster Snow Goons, which is another, another fantastic strip. Uh, to be honest, is when I look at these, and it's, it's somewhat ruefully, I always look at Calvin and Hobbes' work because when Bill Watson stopped Calvin and Hobbes, he, he, it's like the end of a relationship for a lot of us. We felt like we'd been dumped. You know, and then the fact that we couldn't even go out there and and buy a T-shirt to remember our old friend, by, <laughs> which is almost it's almost how I felt. You know, a little bit of me died inside. It's a shame because it was not only funny and moving and true, but as a parent, I think the things that Calvin Hobbes' mum and dad went through, it was almost like a little bit of a a fantastic warning sign for anyone thinking of getting into parenting about how bad it could be, and so. Uh, yeah, no, I miss it. So let, oh, let's, well, it's enough of me banging on about how much I love Calvin and Hobbes. Let's see if the other people do. It was the idea that um, it was just this little boy with his imagination. And it's this little boy who creates this, all these adventures, all this world in just his head. Classic thing you start off with a comic strip of him on an alien planet and he's running around fighting aliens and all this. And then at the very last page you cut and you find he's just in a cardboard box in his back garden. And it's that wonderful thing when you're running around playing as a child and your mum shouts dinner. And that's what happens at the back of this. You have this whole kind of very sci-fi comic strip for about two, three, four pages of him fighting aliens, running away, fighting monsters. And then there's this bit when he hears this kind of dinner, Calvin, and he's just in a cardboard box in the back garden. <laughs> and his mum just called him in. And you know that because when you're running around with your kids playing football and, you know, it's Wembley and it's 1822, whatever the stupid school is, and then your, mom, your dad comes along and says, come on in, and that's it. And that's just what it kind of brings back to you, that idea. Of, you remember what it was like being six, seven years old, just running around playing. But it's just, it's amazing, really. I mean, we're both fans, we're standing here looking at it. I find it almost impossible to imagine what Calvin, the character, would have been doing as an adult. I mean, the whole point of these cartoon strips, they live in this permanent twilight world of childhood, you know. Yeah. But Calvin, who's such a rebel, and he had that imagination. Yeah. Have you ever, what do you think he might be doing I, as an adult? I just can't imagine him as just in a very normal job, almost bittersweet, kind of sat there at a desk, hating um, his job, but kind of sat there because he's grown up. I would imagine kind of looking out the window and remembering, remembering his childhood, remembering Hobbes, who he's kind of probably in his parents' loft now somewhere and moulding. I mean, Calvin to me, and I'm not being funny now, I see him as Kurt Cobain. I, I actually <laughs> see him as being incredibly creative and yeah. brilliant and, and dying young. It's a terrible thing, but Calvin was such a rebel. You see him following his dad's path, I suppose <laughs> that's the thing is, but you just saying Hobbes in the loft going mouldy, I'm almost shedding a tear. <laughs> <laughs> Was he difficult to deal with over the years? Well, not from uh, an editorial or creative perspective. We had a great relationship, and he took our suggestions well, and, and we took his uh, paths creatively and, and uh, went down those paths with him. It was really from the commercial and business side that we had some very public disagreements. We wanted to move into the traditional licensing areas, uh, possible animation uh, and, and that type of outlet for the characters. He was just not interested and was firmly adamant and although we had the contractual rights to do those things, uh, we decided it, it probably would be in our own interest as well as his to not explore them. You've got gold right there, right in front of you, and there's, there's this man saying, no, I do not want to turn lead into gold. I'm, I'm quite happy with my lead. You know, what must, must that feel like for you as a businessman? 
Well, it was very frustrating, and, and uh, he went public with his disagreements with us, and and uh, we went public with our disagreements with him, and, and you're right. I mean, we can see that part of the goal because we're almost at the end of the rainbow, but uh, ultimately we decided it you know, was the right thing to do was, was to not to push him on those things. I can't say it was an easy decision, nor was it done without some reluctance, but it, it was a decision we made, and I think we garnered some benefit from it in terms of respect from the creative community, and, and more importantly, uh, we have a, the opportunity to work with a great talent who didn't end up murdering us because <laughs> we exploited him beyond his wishes. Okay, I hear you say, Watterson can well afford to say no, but actually he did have some form in this. When he was working in a windowless office on minimum wage, he was offered a nationally syndicated comic strip, but turned it down, not knowing if he'd ever get another break simply because the strip was being used to launch merchandise. I'm here in the centre of Oxford, surrounded by shops full of Charlie and Lola pencil cases and Garfield underpants, to meet Kelvin Gardner, head of the Licensing Industries Merchandising Association, to find out the scale of the kind of temptation Watson would have faced when that big break finally came. Well, Kelvin and Hubs is one of the widest ever um, stripped individual comic strips. He may have become a wealthy man just through syndication, but especially in America where merchandise and licensing was more or less invented, you know, with the, the mythical Mickey Mouse watch, it's very, very unusual to find people will be so blanket against it. I mean, in terms of the sort of stuff we see on the high streets there, I mean, we're in front of a shop here uh, in Oxford. I can see there's a Garfield uh, doll there. Yeah. Uh, SpongeBob, I know he's yeah, very, very, very popular. popular Paddington, it's nice to see something British in there. <laughs> yes, um, if Bill Watterson came up to you now and he said, uh, Kelvin, I've changed my mind. I've decided to uh, take the shilling. Would you say that he'd missed the boat now because it's, has it been too long or do you think he'd have his hand bitten off? I think he'd still have his hand bitten off because fundamentally Calvin and Hobbes had an interesting look. It helps that one of the characters was an animal, you know, a tiger, a leopard, a lion, a bear like Paddington. Um, they, they turn into merchandise very easily. And if he did that, if you were the man and you were given... And Watson said, I'll tell you what, Calvin, you can make five things. What would you make? <laughs> Plush toys of Hobbes in particular. It's got to be the plush toy, not of Calvin, but of Hobbes. Would he have the suckers? Would he be Garfielding on the window? <laughs> well, I'm not sure about that, because that was Garfield's <laughs> unique look. But yeah. they'd come up with his own position. We'd have to have a calendar, because of the sort right. of fans. I've got a cuddly Hobbes. I feel like I'm on the generation game. <laughs> I've got my cuddly Hobbes. I've got my calendar. I'd then go for something to drink out of. I'd go for a diary. That, does that give me one? Have I got you got one, one left. One thing. I think if it was only one other thing, I'd go for a poster because uh, easy to produce and you could show your allegiance to Calvin and Hobbes immediately. If, if it's not the poster, it would be the T-shirt. How well do you think that those five items could do for you? If I had the rights for three years, I could probably sell merchandise worth £10 million over three years. Wow. Is that just for the UK or would that be a global figure? If you're talking about something that really travels the world, you are talking about 50, 100 million. I mean, the ultimate prize is one of immense, absolute immense magnitude. It's quite a big deal that Watson turned down this kind of opportunity, isn't it's, it? Uh, it's, it's just very, very, very rare for anybody to do that. Uh, you have to have a, a mixture of absolutely pure artistic idea of what it is you've been achieving, coupled, I think, with fear. I think fear is part of it. To a certain extent, don't, don't you think he's right, though? Wouldn't there be a danger that, that people might just think, oh, there's that cuddly toy, that lovely tiger, and not even know the origins of, of Hobbes? You know, uh, the fact that profligate marketing actually dilutes the original vision. Well, I can see why somebody might be worried about that, but it, it, the other great beast of comic strip licensing, Peanuts, proves the opposite. Peanuts is 60th anniversary this year. The comic strip is still going strong all over the world, and yet there are thousands of licensed products out there. If you're a Calvin and Hobbes fan, maybe you'd probably want to wear a T-shirt to show the world that you are a Calvin and Hobbes fan. And at the moment, you can't do that. All I want him to say yes to is a badge. <laughs> that's, that's Seriously, Kelvin, that's all I'm after. I collect badges, a Calvin and Hobbes one. I've got a space. One, Just a limited one. Edition. Only one. I only want one. I'm, I'm not a pushy man. I'm, I'm my phone in myself. I've got some felt pens, and, you know. <laughs> His lawyers will be after me now for my badge. <laughs> I'm now heading out of the centre of Oxford, 
towards an industrial estate on the outskirts of town and the offices of the legendary British comic 2000 AD, where I'm going to be talking to two of the more unexpected fans of Calvin and Hobbes, uh, the editor Matt Smith and one of the artists, Boo Cook. And me and Boo are going to sit down with our pens and our paper and uh, find out exactly why it's so difficult to draw a little boy and a tiger. And this is it just here. So we're actually I'm here with Boo now, and we're going to try and we, we we're having a little drawing party. Is what we're doing. We're both over uh, some some Calvin and Hobbes books here, and we're we're just trying to capture a little bit of the sort of the drawing style of Bill Watson. Yeah, it's it's worth pointing out as well that Calvin and Hobbes they're kind of opposites. One of them's a little tiny round guy, and the other one's a big long stretched thing. With some cartoon strips, it's very much about the background. There's no, there's very little background in Calvin and Hobbes, isn't there? Very minimal compared to a lot of comic art, where you know some of it can be even almost photo real. This stuff just goes straight up your optic nerve to the brain, and I think that's part of the reason why it's so addictive to read yeah it just slides down your brain hole wow oh, that's good calvin you're doing there very good <laughs> calvin those button eyes and that you know that that just that simple nose well i dare say that uh, what's taken me about 15 minutes to come up with would probably have taken him about 30 seconds and would be 10 times better some of the uh, images are so simplistic that he's, he literally must have just dipped his brush in the ink, gone whoosh, one line, that's the bottom of Hobbes' belly, whoosh, another line, that's his back. As an artist, that's that's got to be pretty satisfying. But the detail in the... Whenever Calvin's in his own head, it's a much richer artistic experience, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that probably is the case when you're a kid. There's a strip here where a, where a dinner that his mum gives him actually attacks him, eats him and kills him and then and then the parents are dancing with joy <laughs> at the end of it. There are some dark moments in Calvin and Hobbes here. There's one in there where he's just happily sat there hammering nails into his mum's coffee table. <laughs> it's just like, what the hell are you doing? Is, is that a trick question? <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I can remember doing things like that. There's a great one where he's just hammering. He's holding a pot from the kitchen that he's hitting with a spoon, just non-stop for frames. And then the mum comes in and goes, can't you stop that, please? I've had enough. And then and then he just goes to the calendar, just ticks the calendar off. <laughs> My job done for the day, you know. But the thing is, when you look at someone like Watson, you never want to pick up a pen again. You, you see, when when work like that has been done, there's a perfection to it. Th there's, a, there's a great, there's a single panel image here, which is Hobbes jumping on Calvin. The motion, the amount of stretch that he puts in the tiger, it's a, an astonishing feat, you know, to have that, that kinetic sense in just a very simple cartoon strip. It, essentially, a kind of stripy sausage yeah. with, a, with a grin. The editor of 2000 AD, you're with me now. Why, how can you be a fan of Calvin and Hobbes? Man, you bring some of the greatest edgy horror to, to our comic-loving kids, and yet you're like this little tiger and the little boy. How did how? Why? How? From when I first, first read it, it spoke to me on a whole different level compared to something like Garfield or, or Fred Bassett or anything like that. I'd say the main audience that really ap appreciates Calvin and Hobbes is, is adults. You see in it the, the level of humour and satire and uh, poignancy. Now, he emerged at the same time into the zeitgeist as, as Bart Simpson did. I mean, I'd identify more with Calvin because he's perhaps a more realistic version of childhood. He's not somebody who goes out of his way to cause trouble the way that Bart might do, but he's somebody who, um, who gets so wrapped up in his own imagination and so wrapped up in, in the life he'd like to live. It's almost extraordinarily for the times it was produced in and it's devoid of cynicism. Yes, I mean, there's a certain level in it where Calvin gets quite annoyed with fellow human beings, especially when they're sort of despoiling the, the nature. You know, um, Hobbes will often make some comment about, you know, how glad he's not human. And, and Calvin kind of says, well, we show us the tiger with you and we could go, go off into the wild somewhere. At the back of the book here, I mean, this is the complete Calvin and Hobbes here. The last strip is from December 1995, was a Sunday strip which is poignantly f finishes well, rather lovely with the words, let's go exploring, mm. which they're the last three words that Calvin and I'm saying. Whew. 
about 20 years ago i used to uh, do a west ham fanzine with some friends called fortunes always hiding and i was the cartoonist and one week as a bit of a gag i thought i'd pay tribute to one of their players alvin martin and i did a cartoon strip which i very wittily called <laughs> alvin and hobbs <laughs> Oh dear. But turning Calvin to Alvin meant more than just losing a capital letter. It meant losing a key reference, a key illusion within the original strip. I'm off to see someone now who's going to help me be a bit more philosophical about it. So beautiful afternoon uh, uh, and uh, avid readers of Calvin and Hobbes will know that they get up to many of their finest adventures in the back garden so uh, I thought uh, it was time that I repaired to somebody's back garden uh, but uh, not a small boy and his tiger but uh, uh, philosopher, philosophy author, philosophy lecturer Nigel Warburton. Tell me a little bit about, well, for, for a kick-off, Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin and Hobbes were two philosophers, weren't they? Uh, tell us a little bit about them. As far as the cartoon strip's concerned... What you really need to know is that Calvin believed in predestination and Hobbes had quite a low view of humanity. And some of the themes that come out are actually consistent with those two thinkers. There are discussions about free will and should, you know, they're, they're riding a go-kart down a hill and talking about the impact of choice that they make if they turn left and what's going to happen if they turn right. But for me, it's something else very philosophical about the way that these cartoons are constructed. Underlying them all is a notion of perspective. You see life from the perspective of a child who's got an amazing creative imagination or from the perspective of a stuffed tiger or from the perspective of parents who think that the stuffed tiger is just a stuffed tiger and can't talk and can't think. Most of the punchlines turn around a shift of perspective. So for me, it's quite Nietzschean. Nietzsche famously thought there's no such thing as objective truth. What you have is a number of different perspectives on the world. Can you um, put a Nietzschean spin on Peanuts or, or Garfield? I'm sure you could, but that would be pretentious. <laughs> I mean. But in this case, it's clearly constructed into the cartoons. Do you think that uh, Watson was an unfulfilled philosopher himself? I don't think he's unfulfilled. I think he succeeds. It's forcing us to decenter a bit and think, you know, I'm stuck in my dogmatic ways of thinking, and right next to me, there's this kid who's got a completely new take on the world where everything is possible, and you can just imagine going into a garden and turning into a monster or a cardboard box becomes a machine for replicating myself. You know, there are just, there's no end to the, the imagination. Here's a guy who is a brilliant communicator directly, so it's at one level, overtly, you're dealing with a philosophical issue about choice and free will. But at this other level, there are all these games about different takes on reality going on, which are themselves showing you philosophy. I mean, the, these characters are little philosophers. They are discussing as two philosophers might well, you know what's the point of life and i know it's all very well it's the tiger but it yeah. isn't the whole thing is an internal dialogue isn't yeah. it internal to whom to, to calvin it's calvin it's calvin's imagination it's come out of so it's, it's, it's it, oh i dispute that because it's not all from calvin's perspective that's what's interesting because if it were just from calvin's perspective it wouldn't be so clever Hobbes what happened toy yeah, but we don't you just see... You quite upset when I said yeah. that. That's what I quite <laughs> <laughs> I thought... <laughs> Wouldn't it be terrible to get the end of the interview and you actually had another... Yeah. Oh, the tiger's a toy! <laughs> <laughs> but no, but, but th it's Calvin. This is, this is what I wanted to get to. It's Calvin that's saying the things that are coming out of Hobbes. Yes, but not every frame in every story is from Calvin's perspective. So in this one, there are seven, just seven images, basically. And within that, we get this um, Trinosaurus stomping around a playground, and it's the middle of recess, and the, it's eating the kids as they go into the classroom, basically. <laughs> and uh, you think, what on earth is going on? Where's Calvin? Where's Hobbes? And then it cuts to the, the classroom, and the teacher's saying, where's Calvin? And the kids look out of the window, and they're saying, well, he's out there yelling or something. <laughs> and at that point, you suddenly realise the Trinosaurus is Calvin's imagination. And you've got the switch where you're not seeing things from Calvin's point of view at all. In the final frame, you see it from the point of view of a kid in the class or the teacher. And the other kids don't have his imagination. They're the prosaic ones again. But ultimately, yeah. it's not Calvin. It's the artist behind them. That's the point, isn't it? It's about the nature of art. We're creating these different perspectives in art. You've either made me want to never read Calvin and Hobbes again or form a religion based around it and I can't make up my mind which. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I felt quite sad when it was announced that he wouldn't be doing Calvin and Hobbes anymore. I think if he came back, it, it would diminish the work he'd already done to me. 
Is that is is that unfair of me? Do you think to just view it in this pure, pristine, this body of work? Look, the Rolling Stones kept going, and the Beatles didn't. You know, that's actually perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you're right. Okay. Yeah. That looks good. Well, I hope he doesn't come back. <laughs> When Calvin and his buddy headed off into the snow after ten glorious years, millions of lives around the world were left that little bit the poorer. Rather more so in the case of his editor, Lee Salem. What was your reaction when you spoke to Bill and he said, I've, I've had enough now? Just this side of a total breakdown, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, obviously, the, the, obviously the financial ramifications were uh, considerable. But the, the personal uh, considerations we had to factor in. And, and I think Bill just thought he had to explore these characters as much as he could. He couldn't do anything more with him. We had some, some rough spots over the years with Bill, but I think, uh, I think the parting was amicable. Yeah. And we keep in touch and talk about some things. And my fingers are always crossed that he may call one day and say, you know, I changed my mind. I'm going to do a comic strip. <laughs> is that, is that, do you think that's a possibility? No, I don't. I'm always an, opt- I'm always <laughs> an optimist. That is very honest of you, sir. <laughs> what do you think it is about Bill that makes him value his privacy so much? I, I think he drew a distinct line early on between his artwork and his own life, and, and it was more than just arm's length, obviously. He thought that Bill Watterson, the person in the life, uh, should be of no interest to the public, and if they were, he wasn't going to participate. He liked the fact that people read his strip and enjoyed what he did, but again, that was a whole different realm for him. As a fan, do you miss Calvin and Hobbes at all, Lee? It's one of my uh, three or four favorite strips, and, and I have the luxury that not a lot of other people have. I have a few on my wall that remind me of how, how glorious those days were when he was in papers every day. I already knew that Calvin and Hobbes were fantastic characters, that the artwork that brought them to life was beautifully executed. What I've learned, perhaps, is just how remarkable a figure Bill Waterson is, standing firm time and again in his refusal to cash in and sell out. Best of all, though, there's been the chance to just open up the books and delight in that ten-year body of work that amounts to a great hymn to the power of the imagination. So come on, close your eyes. Let's go exploring.